You are listening to Megan is not a parent, but, and today's episode is brought to you by Positive Parenting Class Pass, six simple positive parenting classes to kickstart your positive parenting journey. You can start today at BeKindCoaching.com slash class pass. In today's episode, we will be chatting about what trauma responses are. We're continuing on this exploration of trauma and childhood trauma, just exploring it more, getting more uh, neutralized in this topic. And just like I've said in previous episodes, I invite you to take care of you in this. This is always going to be on the podcast. So make sure that you are taking care of you. So make sure you walk away when you need to take a break. If you need to make sure that you really are leaning into getting cozy and making sure that you are comfortable and safe as you're listening, drink lots of water and be gentle with yourself in this episode. So now I invite you to get cozy, grab your notebook, and let's dig in. Welcome to Megan is not a parent, but the podcast where I, your host, Megan Ford, former early childhood educator turned positive parenting coach, helps parents just like you learn how to deal with your strong-willed child's difficult behavior. I've been described from my clients as a blend between Brene Brown and Miss Frizzle, you know, the one from the magic school bus. I help bring awareness and hold space for the hard conversations and make big concepts like behavior and relationships and temperaments easy to understand and easy to implement. If you're a parent who struggles with your child's loud, dramatic, disruptive, over-the-top behavior, but don't think a parenting coach would help you because those are just for the bad parents or those parents, then this episode is especially for you. I invite you to grab a journal cozy blanket, a warm beverage, and enjoy what you're about to explore. As we have in the past episodes, I'm going to offer this disclaimer that I am a parenting coach, and this information is for education and entertainment. It is not a substitution for professional mental health support, but I do find it very valuable in the work that I do with parents to help teach them new parenting tools that we can explore why this is the big why, why this work is so important, why this work is so critical for us to all become aware of and learn from and soften into. And so same disclaimer that this focus is on parenting. The more we know, the more empowered we can be in the situations. So we are perfectly designed to survive. Our bodies adjust to navigate our circumstances. It's really our brain's most important focus so that when we are in scenarios where we are facing threats and dangers, that we learn our protective stances that we can survive. Just like as we were talking about in assumptions, when we're thinking about the tigers that we see and we start to learn about how to respond to the tigers or the threats in our life so that when we are out in the wild and we come across things, our brain can start to pick those up and kick us into our survival so that we can just see little glimpses and then fill in the blanks and say, whoop, this may be a threat. Let's get into our protective stances. And that, in that sense, is an adaptive strategy, being able to assume that we see a tiger and then find safety. That is an adaptive strategy. That is something that we want to do so that we stay alive. But in this process, sometimes it can become maladaptive, meaning sometimes when we see things in the metaphorical forest, we can interpret them as tigers, where really they may be just house cats. We talked about this in our last episode. And we also talked about this concept in the episode about assumptions, the function of assumptions, why we make assumptions and how assumptions are there to to keep us safe. But if we leave those assumptions unchecked, we may be shifting into our survival stances when it's simply something as docile as a house cat. I say docile, but I guess it wouldn't be docile if you were allergic to cats, but I think we all get what I mean. So This system that we do is that we're scanning for threats. So our brain, again, perfectly wired to keep us alive, having the main focus of survival, our brain unconsciously scans every fifth of a second. So in every second, it scans for safety five times. 
So let's say this podcast has been going on for about mm, 10 minutes. I can't even do the math on that. How many times your brain has scanned for safety? And it's important to note that safety, that lower level, that, that reptilian brain safety is happening on an unconscious level. We are not aware. We are not aware of how much energy is expelled, keeping us safe. So when we're thinking about this process and how our brain is wired and we relate it into traumatic events, just like we talked about how traumatic events can be the experience, the event, and how we navigate through it, a traumatic event or experience happens when that person's coping strategies, when the, the, the strategies of navigating through it are overwhelmed. So when we are in the face of a real life tiger and we are alone by ourselves, we can shift into that over flooding when the situation is asking more from us than we have to give. In our stress series class, I vision this as like an overflowing toilet. So think about that. That's something very neutral to kind of illustrate this point that when a toilet overflows, it is because the capacity, it's over capacity. It starts flowing out. And the trauma in this, it could be structural trauma, it could be flooding, it could be uh, getting into the floorboards. That happens when the flooding overcomes the tools that we have available to help stop the flooding. Same with us. When we become over flooded and our coping strategies or our tools that we have access to are not enough, that's when the traumatic experience or event can last. And then we start to go into protection mode. So in taking this metaphor of an overflowing toilet, maybe we turn off the water, but now it has almost made the toilet not functional. But if we are going into a protective stance, then we have protected the floors from getting wet. We are now in a space where we can avoid future flooding. And then we can start to look for other ways of expelling waste. And sometimes we can go all the way back to using outhouses. I told my husband about this, <laughs> this metaphor today. And he was like, oh, this is a little bit, mm, I don't know, Megan. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go with it because it really just feels so relevant. And now when I can think about it, I'm like, ah, yes. Where are we going back to such a primal state that we've now solved the problem by going like so far off course and yet an outhouse will help protect the floorboards from getting flooded. We don't have to worry about water. We don't have to worry about tools. We can go all the way back to being like, well, we'll just do this. And sometimes that helps, right? Sometimes it's, it's helpful to do that. And sometimes it's not helpful. And that's what we're talking about today is that it's not the thing, but it's how we're using the thing. What are the stories we hold about the thing? What are the beliefs that we hold about the thing? And what are we telling ourselves about the thing? And even as we're sitting here, I'm going to pose this question. Are we even aware of the stories that shape and guide our relationships or shape and guide our actions or shape and guide the tools that we have and how we're using them? Are we aware of our metaphorical outhouses? Are we aware of how we are avoiding things by using the tools that we have available to us? And are we aware of where that is either helping us or limiting us? And when I was thinking about this more, I was like, well, this makes sense. This makes sense why we do this. Our brain is designed to do this. It's designed to protect us and keep us safe. It's designed to ensure our safety. And that's because we have a negativity bias. And when I say we have a negativity bias is that we are primed for survival. We are primed to make sure that those dangers are avoided because if we can avoid dangers, then we can stay alive. In doing further research on this negativity bias, I, I read a study that just was like, it blew my mind. That research suggests that this negativity bias starts to emerge in infancy, specifically three months old, three months old very young infants tend to pay greater attention to positive facial expressions, tone of voice, and start to begin this shift as they near one year of age. So it starts at three months and then they start to shift within a year. That's fascinating. That's amazing. That's how in tune infants are. And if I take this 
this like one step further back to think about how in our society, we undervalue those years. But in those years, children, though they are not able to give us verbal, they're not able to uh, talk to us and engage with us on an adult level, infants are just soaking in everything. They're taking everything in. And how powerful is it that now that we know from past episodes that nonverbal communication speaks the loudest, now we can start to become attuned to like, wow, this, this started so much younger, definitely younger than I thought. But such power in checking our nonverbals, checking our tools, becoming aware of these spaces and noticing how our negativity bias impacts our relationships, impacts the way we problem solve and impacts our perceptions. How is it that we are designed perfectly to survive in those spaces? And how is our our wiring, our brains designed to scan for safety five times every second? And that we know that now we're going to filter it through our negativity bias. Like that's yeah. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot of energy that's happening in the background that I think for the majority of my life, I wasn't even aware that it was happening. And yet again, we are so finely tuned that it's bringing awareness to those spaces that we lack awareness in brain break moment. All right. I know, I know that I can go deep way fast. So let's just take a pause here to take a deep breath in and let it out and listen while I let you know that this episode is brought to you by me, Megan, and my positive parenting class pass. Positive parenting class pass are six simple positive parenting classes to kickstart your positive parenting journey. Those classes include positive parenting 101, which is a class that is just designed to give you the first steps in what positive parenting is and what it is not. Um, second class is emotional validation. In this class, we dig into how can we show up to have your child feel seen and heard in their lived experience. The third class is setting boundaries, all about communicating, enforcing, and allowing testing of your secure and consistent and firm boundaries. The fourth class is a class called ending entitlement. Inside of this class, we dig into how we are showing up using tools of entitlement and how we can start to release those tools and begin practicing tools of empowerment and choice. And we know that what we put down, they're going to pick up. The fifth class is a class all about natural consequences. This is a class that gets very clear and you'll walk away knowing what an imposed consequence is, what a logical consequence is, and most importantly, how to begin utilizing natural consequences so your children begin learning from their lived experience. And the final class is a class all about apologizing. I like to say that connection is the most skipped over step and recovery is the least utilized step. So in that step, you'll start to learn how to show up and use impactful and effective apologies so that your child knows that you see them and hear them and care about them. If you are looking to begin your journey today, then I highly encourage you go to BeKindCoaching.com slash class pass and dig into the classes starting today as my free gift you will receive Raising Respectful Kids, which is my three-part video series all about how to stop focusing on adding on more decorations to your child and to you and to your relationship, and instead starting to reinforce and build a solid and secure foundation together. I can't wait to hear all of your amazing wins from the steps that you take inside of Positive Parenting Class Pass. All right, ready to get back to our episode? Before we get back, let's take one more deep breath together and take a deep breath in and let it out and let's go. When we're talking about trauma and this negativity bias and how we are wired, there is a model called the triangle of traumatic stress. And when I started learning about this, I was like, wow, okay, this all makes so much sense. These are essentially the metaphorical outhouses of views on self, views on world, and views on the future, how we get to this space, how we get so far removed that we start falling into these categories. So signs of 
traumatic stress or, or spaces of overwhelm would be if you have views on the world that sound like the world is a dangerous place or people cannot be trusted or life is unpredictable. Those are spaces that again, keep you safe, keep you protected, but also keep you limited. So it may keep the toilet from over flooding, but it also may be limiting yourself by inhibiting spaces of how you show up in the world. In the areas of views about yourself, it sounds like saying things like, I'm incompetent. I should have reacted differently. Invalidating your own experience in that. This is, this is too much for me to handle. Or I am damaged goods, right? Again, we create this lens of protection by undervaluing ourselves. If I can keep myself small, then I can keep myself safe. I can keep myself protected. I can keep myself invisible. And then how those views on world, views on selves, then impact our views on the future. So views on the future are like, things will never be the same. There's no use. Why should I even try? I don't have to, to, to worry about that. What's the point? It's hopeless. Once we start to see those as like those universal outhouses, then it makes sense like, oh, something happened and that's a protection. We're leaning into spaces that protect ourselves. Now that all makes sense. Now I'm not going to try and change, try to get you to change those thoughts. I'm going to work to, to help support you in knowing your value, in building trust, in staying present and helping you value these things. So that then you can begin to open up. I'm going to start doing my part, meaning I'm going to start staying present. I'm going to work, be working towards staying present. I'm going to start to work towards being attuned by resonating so that I can build trust because trust equals safety. That's why I say we practice where it feels safe. We practice these skills in spaces that feel safe and supportive to us so that we can help mitigate this, so that we can start showing up in the spaces that feel a little bit more unsafe. This came up recently, I think in morning Monday intentions, and it was uh, Stephanie in the comments was talking about how she can't wait to start being challenged on her values because now she's getting solid and grounded in her values for herself so that then when her values are challenged by others, she can stand boldly in them. That's a powerful thing. That's a powerful thing to realign to your values, get very grounded in your values, get very connected in those values so that when they are challenged, we don't revert back into just giving them up. When we start to ground in ourselves and become aware and heal and do that work, then we can start to lower our defenses. Because when our brain is perceiving threats, it activates that defense response. It activates, those alarms start going off. No matter if it's a tiger or if it's a cat, if we never take time to distinguish and discern between them, then anything that's orange will throw that alarm going off. Activate defenses, put up the shields. That's what we are designed to do because the main focus is survival. Those defenses, as we were talking about, are adaptive. When they're in the presence of a threat, when we are eye to eye with a tiger, a real life tiger, those defenses that shoot up, those things that get activated, we want them to do that. That's what they're there to do because our goal is to stay safe and alive. So those trauma responses are adaptive when they are in presence of an, a real threat and they become maladaptive or unhelpful when we perceive the threat that's not there. So what we will be unpacking in the next four episodes is what does a flight response look like in children and in ourselves? Why is it adaptive? Why and how does it become maladaptive? What is a fight response? How was a fight response serving us and how is it no longer serving us? How was it adaptive and how is it maladaptive? 
How is a freeze response serving us? Those alarms that are going off, how did it keep us safe? And how is it keeping us limited? And finally, the fawn response. How is the fawn response keeping us safe and now limiting us? So we're gonna look at how are those ways, fight, flight, freeze, fawn, how is that adaptive and helping when we are in the spaces of real threats? How do we start to build those responses and defenses? And then those same fight, flight, freeze, fawn, how does it then shift into becoming maladaptive and hurtful and limiting when we just perceive the threat? Meaning the ways that we are seeing it, how are we like, ooh, is that a cat or is that a tiger? How is it sending up responses? And then how can we soothe those responses so that then we can start to build resilient responses so many people find healthy ways to cope with, respond to, and heal from trauma. So it's that the thing, it's not the thing, it's what we do with the thing. It's when those alarms are going off, how can we start to listen to the alarms and then soothe the alarms? Often people automatically reevaluate their values and redefine what is important after a trauma. Such resilient responses include increased bonding with family and community, Redefined or increased sense of purpose and meaning, increased commitment to personal mission, revised priorities, and increased charitable giving and volunteerism, meaning the giving back. Once we've gone through something and healed through that space, then we're like, okay, I want, I want to actually build that trust. Seeing it in starch contrast to the triangle of traumatic stress. It starts to heal the views of the world, the views about self and the views about the future. When we start to realign and refocus and heal, then we can show up to expand. We can start to deepen relationships. We can start to hold that space in ourselves and in, in others. And this is at the crux of why I show up, why I do what I do, why it's important to have these conversations, why it's important to dig into this work. Because we, if you're part of my community, chances are you've experienced this as well. Being raised with punishments, they inflict pain. The pain of getting taken something away, the pain of fear that something will be get, getting taken away. The physical pain of corporal punishments, the emotional pain of humiliation. Punishments inflict pain. Pain initiates defense. When we are in pain and stress, our brain is designed to survive and we will kick up those defenses. And at the bottom of all of it, fear-based punishments elicit defenses. That's why I say it's counterproductive. It does not help. It's at the, the root of everything that I do. And when we can hold ours, we can hold children's. When we can hold ours, we can hold children's. When we can hold and explore ours and heal ours, that's what truly breaks the cycle so that we're not passing it on. When we can heal from our pains, when we can become aware of the defenses we hold. I ask this question often, is your child activating your defenses? And if so, what is that illuminating? Where can we grow? Where can we start to delineate? Is this a tiger or is this a cat? Is this a real threat or is this a perceived threat? Not that the threats are not one less than the other, but is this something that is helpful or is it hurtful? And so that's where we're going to leave it today. Just an introduction. This is what it is and this is why they happen. And now we can then talk about uh, navigating through them in the future episodes, how they show up for you and how they show up for the children, how we can become aware to them. to be like, whoop, they're perceiving a tiger right now. So in closing, the questions that I'm gonna leave you with is when do you notice your signs of stress? Are you familiar with them? Have you ever been in those, a space to explore them? And on the flip, 
When do you notice signs of safety? When we talk about listening to our body, our body is telling us. Our body is telling us when we feel stressed. Our body is telling us when we are feeling safe. Last year, I did a whole stress course. It was five classes on how we can hold ours and then help children navigate through theirs. And this was a big part of it is learning how to listen to our bodies. What are the signs that our body is telling us? And then how are we interpreting those signs? And then finally, the last two questions is what habits support your sense of safety and what habits support your sense of stress? That's a hard one. I know, I know that going out for walks eases my mind. I know going outside eases my stress, but I also know that I'm more prone to scrolling on social media. And then if I think about after the fact, which one leaves me in a better state, it's very clear to me going for the walk. And sometimes it's very clear to me, that's just scrolling on social media. But when I slow down to take time to really kind of attune to that, then the truth speaks very loudly. And so that's what we're here to just dig more into it. So like I said, next week, whoop, my slide is wrong up here. We're talking through what does a fight response look like? So if you would like to join, I invite you to come live on Zoom and stay for the Q&A after. And you will find the Zoom room link posted in our Facebook community, Positive Parenting with Megan Ford. And as always, I invite you to show your work. Now, if you've taken notes or have any thoughts or takeaways, I wanna know about them. And there's three ways to share. You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. You can share your thoughts and takeaways on social media and tag me. And you can share your thoughts inside the dedicated post in our Facebook community, Positive Parenting with Megan Ford. Thank you for tuning in and staying to the end. My mission in life is to help support parents in feeling supported and empowered in doing this work. This podcast, my Facebook community, and my programs and book club all help parents work through those phases of awareness, education, and practice. This episode was an awareness episode. Like, let's just talk about it. Let's bring awareness to these and what, what, what their purpose is. And then we'll spend the next few weeks digging into the education and practice of them. It's my favorite thing to do. If you are ready for the next step of this journey together, then I invite you to check out Raising Respectful Kids. It is a three-part video series that covers what positive parenting is and isn't, how to determine if your family is making a positive impact, and how to begin showing up in big ways to make a positive impact on your family's relationship. You can get started today at BeKindCoaching.com slash free class. Friends, I am excited for this series, this little mini series, and I cannot wait to see you next week. Bye, friends.